هستن رو مرکز میدارم Ujjayi everyone, we see all the Ujjayis in the chat, whether you are streaming with us here in West Africa, if you are in the United States, in the UK or Canada, to all of our communities there, we say Ujjayi to you as well. And to all of our supporters around the world, we appreciate you so very much and all the support that you've given us over the years. And for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, we see you, say Ujjayi to you as well. Now, Ujjayi is a traditional greeting that is spoken in the Medu language. 
And Mandu is the oldest language known to humanity, and it is oftentimes referred to as hieroglyphs. My name is Jezerita, and I'm an initiate of the Chicago Earth Center. However, we are very fortunate to be streaming live from the home of our fathers. This is the cradle of civilization. We are here in Medita. Now, many people call it Africa, but in the traditions, we call it Medita. Now, we have a very important lecture topic scheduled for you today called colonial terrorism. And if you think about that notion, colonial terrorism, man, it's really a deep concept because colonialism, it impacts and touches each and every one of us. No matter where we live in the world, it impacts us on practically every facet of our lives. To the point that I was chatting with a couple of people the other day and just wondering how in the world is our lecturer going to be able to tie up this concept in the allotted time that we have for this lecture. But we don't doubt him because he is our Zeshmi, so we are looking forward to the lecture. But before we get into the lecture, I first and foremost want to acknowledge all of our ancestors. And I also want to give a special acknowledgement to our founder, Nebnaba Lamosamori Dinibig, who is a Dogon Kemetic High Priest. And it's interesting because he tells us so many stories about when he was a child, living a humble life, a simple life, in the African bush, minding his own business. He didn't realize that his world was rapidly changing right before his very eyes, until the days he started seeing the colonizers, the missionaries, coming to his home village and they were chasing grown men with chains. And when they, he saw this, he was wondering where are they taking them to? Now they weren't taking them away in slave ships, they weren't taking them to foreign lands or territories, but they were taking them to the colonial classrooms. And anyone who resisted, they would literally chain them to the desk in order to quote unquote, properly educate them. Now, these are the times that our founder decided that he would dedicate his life to ensuring that he would learn as much as he could from the elders, from the masters, from the people who held the traditions very tight. He was going to learn that on his own. So while his peers and his classmates were running around, still living a carefree life, playing soccer every day, he was busy sitting at the foot of the elders, learning and studying, serving in the temples. That was his life. To the point that he became a spiritual master at an early age. And his mother even wondered, why are all of these people of high places, these politicians, these elitists coming to visit her young son? But it was because of the wisdom that he carried and he embodied it. And so from that time, he decided again to dedicate himself to the traditional culture. And he already comes from a long lineage of Dometic Dogon high priests. And they are oftentimes referred to as the shrine keepers. And that is because they have mastered many disciplines such as philosophy, spirituality, metaphysics, geom geomancy, astronomy, as well as natural healing. And he became a master at an early age. And at some point he asked his teachers, he asked his elders, even the kingship of the region, could he go to the diaspora and build a bridge that reconnects humanity back to the authentic comedic culture. And once permission was granted, he traveled around the world and he fluently spoke 13 different languages, and he shared that sacred knowledge. And it is because of these types of sacrifices that we owe such a great debt to our founder. And eventually in 1996, he founded the first Earth Center in the Americas. And since that time, fast forward to this year, we have schools, community centers, cultural centers, study groups on three different continents all sharing those sacred teachings. And so that is how you can get involved. We have four main branches. We have Ancasta Natural Healing, 
this is a branch where we offer services to the public that have been serving humanity for tens and tens of thousands of years. These are traditionalists, they are priests, they are healers who are ensuring that people outside of the continent of Africa have access to herbal as well as spiritual remedies. And then we have Firefly Productions. This is our publishing house where we produce a collection of spiritual as well as academic tools that can assist you in your own spiritual journey. And we also have M Time School of Comedic Philosophy and Spirituality. Now this is where we offer an authentic comedic initiation. We offer classes that are just equipped to assist you and give you the tools that you need, the same type of tools, the principles, the values, the cultural uh, foundation that was preserved in the comedic temples back during the Pharaonic era. And finally, we have projects in Medita. And this is where we show our gratitude to those people, those traditionalists, those humble villages, the kingships, the temples, the priests, those have been preserving our culture for thousands and thousands of years. We assist them in well building and building uh, different structures in their communities. We have restored sacred sites, all sorts of projects that you too can get involved with. So visit us at theearthcenter.org that's the earthcenter.org. And you can find out how you can get involved. You can become a donor, you can be a member, you can volunteer. You can help us with our social media efforts. All of the share, like, follow, share this movement with other people who may be interested. You can visit any of our schools around the world. Now, without further ado, I want to present to you our lecturer today. His name is Nahez Minyu, and he is very dear to us because he too has been very dedicated in his initiation. He started his initiation about 15 years ago, and he studied exclusively under our founder. He was just as dedicated then as he is now, to the point to that just a few years ago, he relocated his entire family here to Africa in order to continue their studies. Again, we are all a great debt to him because not only is he a teacher, he's a healer, he's a cultural activist, and he is also the international director of all the end time schools worldwide. So without further ado, I want to present to you our Zashmi Nahez Menu. Wow, do I Everyone online, worldwide, everyone in all of our centers in the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and in West Africa, Western Merita, Jai, greetings. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are on the planet. I welcome you. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Nehez Beniu. It's a privilege to be here with the chance to speak with you tonight. As Jezerita explained, it is really because of one man's vision, one man's hard work that puts us all together tonight. So that today, spirits from all over the world can come together online to sit and think about, hear about what our ancestral traditions have in their bank of wisdom that can help lead us forward in our lives today. That's all due to one man's hard work, one man's sacrifices. And so I have to start by acknowledging those sacrifices, acknowledging that hard work. We say that it's one man or one person that cooks food for many to eat. So tonight, in some respects, we are all eating from all across the world. They also say that the person that is seen as poor in today's world, the poor only gain respect 
when people start chasing the taste of their food. Because everybody has to eat. Everybody has to eat to live. But when you start cooking so well that people want the taste of what you're cooking, no matter if you live in the biggest house on top of the hill or the smallest hut, people are going, people are going to show you their respect so they can eat what you have. So tonight we all came to taste what Master Nava cooked. And also tonight I know I will be the one cooking for all of you out there. But I'm starting by letting you know that the recipe I'm using, it came from somewhere. I got it from my master. And that's important because in today's world of information, age of information, to protect ourselves, when somebody's bringing us new information, we have to ask them, where did you get it from? Who is your master? And who is their master? Because if the information you're bringing me just came from books, just save me the time and give me the titles of those books. Maybe I can go around your misinterpretation and just see for myself what those words on pages say. But if you're telling me that what you learned came from a master, then I know that you lived with that person. I know that you studied under that person. And I know that that person too studied under someone even to learn the principles of education and apprenticeship. And that's really how human beings since the beginning of time have been learning have been mastering knowledge. So this is an important question. And so I wanna make that clear and acknowledge my master and where the information I'm bringing tonight is coming from. Master Naba, after starting the Umtam School of Comedic Philosophy and Spirituality, after starting the branches that make up the Earth Center that Jizrita explained in the introduction, he returned back to his homeland of Burkina Faso to bring his work and his mission here. And that's an important thing to point out because in today's world where what we see as wealth seems to exist in the countries that are called first world, we have so many people that leave the continent of Africa chasing that wealth, chasing some success, and they don't really come back here to bring it home. But after Master Naba built the Earth Center as an organization, after he wrote his book, after he wrote some books, after he did a lot that he had to do to bring this mission to the world, he came back to Burkina Faso, which very recently was known as one of the poorest countries of Africa. He came back to bring the wealth that he had brought to the world Home. to bring the wealth that he had brought to the world home for any of the people that were being disconnected by the procedures and the antics that Jesuita was mentioning, forcing them into colonial school, forcing them into colonial religions. When he came back to bring that mission, of course he had to promote it before he could start his first school. And in promoting it, he started a radio show that was broadcasted around Burkina Faso. He also was a guest on other radio shows. And one evening on a radio show, after he said what he had to say, after the interview was coming to a close and the host opened up the call lines, for a question and answer period. And we too will have a question and answer period at the end. So your questions that you type in the chat will be brought. But this day on this radio show, when the question and answer period came, a woman came on the air and she brought a message that we all know. 
She told Master Naba that he was evil. He was, he needs Jesus. Jesus is the light. He needs to be saved. Whatever he's saying is backwards, is dark, et cetera, et cetera. We all know it, right? We all know that message. We all heard that message from our pastor. We all read that message in books. We all heard that message from slave owners. We heard that message even from our relatives, even from our grandmothers, from our mothers, our fathers. That's not a new message. And Masanaba stayed calm. He listened to the lady. And he said, you know what, sister? Please give yourself a chance. I know what I'm bringing is ahead of its time, is new for you. But instead of having an emotional reaction and cutting yourself from a chance to learn something new, it's better you calm yourself down and just give yourself some time to think about something that's new to you. It was really kind of amazing just to see someone be condemned, someone be even told they're evil, and that person stay calm and only show care back to the person that did it. So I'm acknowledging Master Naba as I start. And as I welcome all of you from around the world, I'm acknowledging him. And I'm also asking you to bring an open mind to the conversation we'll have tonight. Because if I thought I didn't have anything new to bring, uh, I might as well stay quiet, right? There's a lot. There's a lot to do online. There's a lot to see. I'm sure there's a lot to do wherever you are. If I didn't have anything new to bring, I might as well stay quiet. If I'm bringing something new, then you will have to bring an open mind. And to be honest, I will have to bring the same open mind to give a lecture to people that I can't see their faces, to give a lecture to a mechanism that's just a, a lens. But we'll take that open mind together. OK. Tonight's topic is colonial terrorism. Colonial terrorism, which is a very deep topic, as the sister pointed out. And we hear more and more today this notion of terrorism. The war on terror, acts of terrorism, the global war on terror. What is the war on terror? What is terrorism? If we just check the dictionary, we see that terrorism is any act of violence or intimidation, any act of violence or intimidation done mainly on civilians, on people who are not armed for, to achieve a political aim. That seems pretty simple. But actually, I left out a part. That's the part that I don't really like. Any unlawful act of violence or intimidation done on civilians to achieve a political aim. The unlawful part starts to bring in a subjectivity. That's even why you see I jumped over. Because whose law? Will that be? Even I think in the UN they have some debates about well, what really can we call terrorism? Because whose law will it be based on? But in the comedic schools, we know that this notion of terrorism is older than that. This notion of terror is old. We even have it in the original language, 
We even have it in the original laws. The original laws, even before laws were man-made. The laws that the comedic temples have kept that were given by the gods to humanity. The first laws that humanity knows. Number 48 of those 77 commandments in the great book of divine ordinances says thou shalt not cause terror. And so this shows us that terror is, is a very old concept. And we've been not supposed to do it for a very, very long time. So how can we understand terror beyond just fright, beyond just fear? In the comedic archives of history, we have a very good example. We have a very good example that happened in the Nile Valley around 600 BC. 600 BCE, before the current era. Really, to be more exact, around 630 BC. And it was at that time that a man named Cambyse arrived in the Nile Valley. And he arrived with ambitions to conquer, to invade and to conquer. He arrived with ambitions for power, for material wealth. And he didn't just come alone. He brought it, a whole army with him. Cambyse is known, even in the modern history books, as a conqueror. And he comes from a line of conquerors. Even the ambition to conquer the Nile Valley was passed down to him by his father. So he was just carrying out his father's work, so to speak. Cambyse arrived in the Nile Valley and was so perplexed at how the people living there were ready to part with their material wealth. He came for that material wealth. It even brought him all the way from Persia. So for them to give it up so willingly, he just didn't understand it. He also didn't understand how they would give him wealth you know, any intimidation he tried to bring, any threats, any uh, aggression. Sure, you can take the wealth, but he couldn't really change their behavior, their lifestyles. Because he was after power, too. But if you can imagine, and I know many of our listeners will know, for those who don't have as much experience. The Nile Valley at that time, 630 BC, was a place where, was a place known for knowledge. It was a knowledge center. People from all over the world came to the, to the Nile Valley to study. The Nile Valley was also known as it is known in today's uh, touristic scene as the Valley of the Kings. So it was known for the sea of authority, the throne. The king of kings is there. And so this was the climate he arrived in. This was the place he arrived in. But it was already a very old culture by the time he arrived. We had throne, we had someone sitting on the throne there one after another for thousands of years before he even arrived. So there was already a system that he, he couldn't just ignore no matter how much he wanted. In comedic society, it's going to be hard for you to find a position of authority and never been, never have been initiated. That's just unheard of. Because every spirit coming into life will go through an initiation just to face life. Now you will go through 
more initiations, initiation after initiation, depending on now where your life is taking you, where your destiny will take you. And if that destiny has taken you to be responsible for others, you will need to be initiated into that. So he realized he would need to do that. And Kambisi even entered the initiations. In the initiations, he was given the nickname Oko. Oko, which in the Madhu language means donkey. In the initiation, we have this custom of giving a nickname to somebody to really show or emphasize the qualities they have that they really need to work on. And so to call a person a donkey, you can see his stubborn, stubbornness, his ignorance, they were really pointing at, digging it. But this is done with every initiate, every initiate that comes to face themselves. So Cambisi started, but Cambisi was so ambitious. Cambisi wanted to be the pharaoh. Cambisi says, if you call me the donkey, then I want the donkey to be a divinized animal. I want you to see the donkey as a god. Kambisi says, from now on, because I said it, you can no longer pray in the temples. From now on, because I said it, you can no longer cultivate wheat. Kambisi says, from now on, all of you must see me as the pharaoh. And as any same community in dealing with a crazy person, they might in front of him go, okay, really? Wow. And then later on in the millet beer huts, in the palm wine bar, you hear people laughing and telling stories about how crazy this man is. What does he really think? We all know how that goes, right? So, Cambisi was getting more and more frustrated because people might smile at him, say, oh, wow, really? Okay. But nobody's stopping praying in the temples. Who's stopping cultivation of wheat? We have to eat. And you, the Pharaoh, I call you donkey. I can't call you Pharaoh. <laughs> so, Cambis is getting more and more frustrated. And at one point, he tries to flex his power. He tries to flex his power. And I'm laughing, but before we all start laughing at him, just like before we start laughing at any crazy person, we have to first see how close it is to us as human beings. Because the reality is, even today in the Umtam schools, we have people come with just as much ambition. We have people come wanting to be the authority on something they don't even know yet. That's a very human thing. Don't, don't hear this and remove it far from yourself because it will have to be based on the resources you have, the experience you have, the upbringing you have. And remember, I said Cambisi was raised to be a conqueror. He had an army. Imagine the damage you could do with your ambition if you had an army, if you had that will. Before we start laughing at him, let's make sure we don't act like him with whatever means we have. So Cambisi was, fr was frustrated, and he utilized what he had because whatever we have to, we use what we have. And he set up his army, he set up his soldiers to stand in front of the temples and tell people, if you try to enter, we will kill you. We will beat you, we will kill you. And he did this to intimidate the community. Oh, he's serious. We better not do it. This was very clearly, we can see by definition, the first act of terrorism that he did, that he did right? But he didn't stop there. 
Because even then, you're trying to change people that have done things. Their fathers also taught them. Their mothers also taught them to do this. You can't just change it that easily. He didn't stop there. In comedic society, as I mentioned, we have this notion of divine animal. He wanted the donkey to be a divine animal. But we have the notion of a divine animal, which, if I can put it simple, when the gods favor an animal, that animal is divine for the, the people that worship that god. So all of the rabbits all over the world will be divine, will be special for the followers of Serket or the worshipers at the temple of Serket. Also, all of the members of a family who has an ancestral divinity that's responsible for that family that favors rabbits, all of them will see rabbits as their divine animal. They won't eat them, they won't kill them, they will hold them with a special regard. We have that type of divine animal. In addition to that, we have the holy cow, and an animal that becomes holy because, or that is holy, because a god themselves even reincarnates in that animal. They bring their energy to the human world through that animal. And so we also have this notion, holy cow. Even now, you still have that saying coming back from this aspect of human history, holy cow. You've heard that before. So we have the one type of holy cow that we have is the apis. And this holy cow is a reincarnation of the God of the dead. And the next move that can be seen made was an unthinkable move to kill the holy cow. But he didn't even stop there. Because you can imagine, he wants to be Pharaoh. He wants to be the one that everybody looks to with as their authority. But people will smile and then laugh as they walk away at him. But then they will go and bow to a cow in his eyes. He was so jealous. So he killed the holy cow, but he didn't just stop there. He even gave the order for people now to come and eat the meat of the holy cow. What do you think people did? He said, you have to come and eat the meat if you don't eat the meat, just lay your head on the guillotine. You'll be executed. What do you think they did? Every person there in the Nile Valley that was there just lined up at the guillotine. There's no question there. You want, you want me to eat the God of the dead or die? There's no question there. I, I, I'm not eating the God of the dead. And so they lined up, and one after another, Cambyses army chopped their head. Chopped their head. He didn't give one person to eat the meat. And he chopped over 2,000 heads. Imagine that. I don't even, I mean, in today's world and sports and all that, I'm sure you've seen 2,000 people. Imagine 2,000 severed heads in front of you. His army was covered in blood. They're in pools of blood up to their knees. Imagine that. And then people just standing in line, proud, ready. No problem. That's what, that's what the option is. I know what I'm doing. This was, I don't even have to say at that point, that by definition is terrorism, the second act of terrorism by Cambyses. This act of terrorism even earned Cambyses the name of the most, or 
the reputation of the most evil man in, in human history because he went as far as killing the God of the dead and then trying to force humanity to eat him. So this was the first act of killing to intimidate people to get them to do a, do a political act or for a political aim. This is a very good example of terrorism that we have in history. But I bring this up also because this was the last act of heroism on such a large scale by so many people, 2,000 people. Can you imagine? Just imagine standing in a line to die. But you standing in the line voluntarily and then as you're standing in it and getting closer, more and more blood is flowing, and you're just walking forward. Whether you can, remember I said, let's keep an open mind. Think about that. Think about what that would look like. That takes a lot of strength. When I say an act of heroism, people couldn't do that today. People since humanity hasn't had the strength, the internal strength to do that. Even they tell us somebody took over an entire plane of over 50 people with a box cutter. And now you're telling me with a guillotine, 2,000 people just said, hey, that's my choice. That's what I'll do. You can only do this when you have very strong values that you connected to. When nobody can separate you from your values. When nobody can take your dignity away from you. You choose to live like this. You choose to live for this. You can't change me from that. You can't intimidate me away from that. That's strength. That's value. That's wealth. A few months ago in our Wisdom of the Nile lecture series, we were speaking about questioning our ideas of wealth. It was after COVID-19 hit and people all over the world saw, hey, my money didn't mean as much. My job didn't mean as much. Even I got a smack on the face that showed my job didn't think I meant anything. people were realizing that maybe there's a wealth that's more important than the money I'm getting or the career that I work so hard for. Because when everybody was afraid of that virus, everybody just wanted to be close to their family, just wanted to make sure they were safe, just wanted to make sure we were safe, just wanted their health, was so afraid for their health. Even today, we still see that. Maybe there's a different type of wealth. In the comedic paradigm, in the Nile Valley civilization, wealth is based on dignity, integrity, the knowledge of life, the knowledge of the world of the gods. And so if now these people are standing on the knowledge of the gods, they've been devoting their life to emulating the gods, to following the 77 commandments, now why would death be the one to now make me ruin all of that? I don't care. You want to kill me? No problem. Now I can go into death as I've always planned, proud of what I did. This is wealth. This is a wealth that nobody can take. Cambisi tried to take it. He wasn't able to. That's what frustrated him more and more to where he went, where no human will go. Who shapes our perception of wealth today? Who shapes our perception of terrorism today? This notion of true value and wealth could be seen because 
even these people from all over the world were coming to Kemet where just because they wanted more knowledge, they wanted to know how these people of Kemet, how these sages, these kings of Kemet can do what they can do, how the priests can do what they can do, how they can master nature, how they can master life. And that's what brought people to them, brought people to study. This is why they were wealthy. It's not for gold. You see, once Kambisi came, they were ready to give him gold. If that's what you want, if I can get rid of you with gold, hey, that's worth that's worth all of this gold, no problem. But for Kemet, what real value for for a Kim, for an individual, for a human being, flesh and blood, what real value does gold bring us? Can we eat gold? Can gold protect us from coronavirus? Even if we make the mask out of gold, it's going to get too heavy. We do, it won't even be comfortable. It's not even practical. We can't live in gold. We, I mean, we could try to wear it. I guess people do that. But what it, it doesn't help our life at all. It doesn't help our survival. What good is it to us? And then above all of that, we will die. And it will be left there. This can't be wealth. Our comedic ancestors had to, I mean, they, they face this. We're not going to play games with ourselves and even mark ourselves down to live for something that we're just going to lose anyways. The reality is that gold was important for them only because it was important for the gods they worshipped. Gold was seen as the body of the gods. Now, if I can provide it to the gods and they find it valuable, then it's valuable to me. But for a human being, I can't eat it. I can't drink it. I mean, I know nowadays there's a lot of, that's why I'm saying, please check the information you get. And there's people even trying to eat gold flakes now and they think it makes them healthy. You're just eating rocks. Real, what if we're talking about reality? Gold doesn't help us with our survival. But if gold is valuable to the gods, then for somebody following the gods, it becomes valuable. It's on the, it's on the crown of our king. It's on the throne of our king because the qualities that he's fitting, the principles he's living by, the commandments he's following, now with that gold, we expect the gods to be with him, to be guiding him. This is becoming a little initiatic now, but even at a very base level, we all have seen, we all have experienced somebody who worked hard to make money, to make riches, and then right before they get it, death takes them. That's what it is to be human. Why would we put all our cards in that basket? So when we were talking about wealth, we weren't talking about Money because I can't do that with paper either. Uh, you eat paper, you heal, you get healed by paper, you drink paper. None of us do that. In the same light or in the same logic, when we were talking about poor, destitute, that also was based on a knowledge of the gods, on integrity, on dignity, on principles. When the comedic history books are talking about poor people coming from north of the Mediterranean, trying to invade, trying to conquer, coming from north like Cambici did, he was called poor and destitute because he lacked knowledge. He was ignorant of how things really work. I mean, he had a whole army. There's a wealth in that, right? Nobody's gonna say he didn't, he didn't have resources the poorness, the poverty he had was different. It was what he didn't know. The quality he lacked in his behavior and his expression. This is very important because now 
if we look around the world today, we look at how our leaders, our political leaders function. We can see that since the time of Cambyses, Julius Caesar, the other conquerors, the political leaders that are in position today all function on the same paradigm. Ambition for material will, ambition for authority. And so the people running the world today have taken us towards those ambitions and left the notion of chasing humanity's true will. So much so that even today, hopefully by now, I haven't had people leave because I'm dropping terms like world of the gods, the gods, the code of human behavior, perfect model. All of these things are so foreign to us now, they even make us uncomfortable. To hear it makes us uncomfortable because to hear it makes us defensive because we associate gods now only with the manipulation those leaders did on us. Those leaders did to gain power because those ne leaders never did things with those words based on knowledge or based on bringing harmony or order in the world. It was just based on them gaining that power over us. That's now the consequence of a world that's now led by people that are just power hungry. This is our reality today. But this is, or not but, but this is why humanity is lost. But as we say in the traditions, if you are in the bush, in the forest, and you find yourself under the same tree more than once, know that you lost. Anybody who's been in the forest, anybody who's been out in the woods and gotten yourself lost, I know you know that feeling. You find yourself lost, you get uncomfortable, you get scared, you start seeing the same tree again and again, even though you know it made you lost, there's some comfort in that tree because at least you've been there. When you really start walking away from where you've been, then you get even more afraid because you already lost, you don't know where you're going. Now I'm going towards somewhere I've never been. That's even more frightening. The human being don't like what we don't know. So that means even to find our way back to the path, it's going to be more uncomfortable than it was being lost. Humanity is lost in time and space. I'm going to open a parentheses now, okay? Because I like to do that. And the one that gave me the recipe liked to do that too. So, we chose this, I chose this lecture to be placed in August. We chose this in the, in the Mutam schools to be placed in August because August brings a very interesting time. If you check in the history, you'll notice a lot of the floods we see happen sometime August to October, a lot of the raging wildfires around the planet, even a lot of the resistance movements, the rebellions amongst humanity happens in a lot of times in August. August, if we're just going on the modern calendar, doesn't really offer things that special. It's the end of the summer, it's the eighth month, it's the month of Augustine, according to our colonizers, it doesn't really 
mean that much. But in the calendar that's much older, that's coming from the Nile Valley, that our modern calendar is plagiarized off of, August is closing the year. It's the last full month of the year. That month is called Mesut Re. And Mesut Re in the traditional calendar is the 12th month of the year. And as it is closing the actual year of the actual calendar, and I'm gonna come back to why I'm saying actual, it now is the time when earth is readjusting before it enters a new cycle. The energies of earth are being readjusted. Nature is readjusting before it enters a new cycle. I say the actual calendar because as I said, the modern calendar we're using now is plagiarized. Why do I say that? The modern calendar, and you can check, and a lot we've given a lot of presentations on the calendar, the science of the calendar, the politics of the calendar. The modern calendar is a year of 365 days, and those 365 days make up the Earth's revol revolution around the sun. But the 365-day cycle or uh, rhythm revolution has an extra quarter of a day, and then that quarter of a day is added up after four years to add another day, a leap year, according to our modern calendar. That year is made up of 12 months, 52 weeks, is that correct? And <laughs> the week is made up of seven days. But we don't really go beyond the increment of a year. The only increments that we have beyond the year are just for convenience and counting. Decade, uh, score, which is not really used anymore, a century, a millennium. But you see, those aren't specific to astronomy. Those aren't giving us anything about what's actually happening amongst the cosmos. That's just how to count. The same way we can have a meter and then a centimeter and then a millimeter. We have a year and then a, a century and then a millennium. Same word, same Latin word. It's not talking about the cosmos. It's just talking about increments. Groups of 10, groups of 100, groups of 1,000. And with that explanation, this notion of a quarter of a day, exactly a quarter of a day, and then you add that, is really far-fetched. But as I said, you can, you can investigate yourself with some of the presentations we've given. This is not a presentation about the calendar, I know, and you wonder when I'm going to close this parenthesis. Um, the is far fetched though because depending on the time of year we might be farther from the sun than another time of year and honest astronomers will tell you scientists will tell you we're still trying to gauge how far we are from the sun it will have to be a measurement taken every day of our movement around the sun so to know exactly how much it is doesn't make sense so they must have got it from somewhere but remember, when we're talking about a civilization like the Nile Valley that worked hard, passionately investigating the world around them to learn nature, to learn the earth so that they can fit in it, that's very different than the modern world that we live in that's made up of leaders that passionately worked only to gain authority. And they will even reinvent everything just so that they can be known as the authority on it. I don't know if you're really following me. We had people that we gave authority to because they proved themselves to have the spiritual honesty necessary 
to investigate the world around them, to master it, to learn it, to master it, to behave according to the principles that help them fit in it. And now we have leaders that said, you know what, some people are have that authority, I just want the authority. I don't need the knowledge, I don't need to prove I have the qualities. I will even reinvent what it is so that you give me the authority and not that one who actually knows. The same thing happened with the calendar. Now information that was taken and you don't really understand, you have to reinvent why it is like that. In the traditional calendar, we have this 365 day increment of time, but that's just a farmer's year because we can see that the cycle of seasons reoccur in that time period. But that's an increment of smaller periods of time. The real year, which is that four year uh, group when that extra day is added is what in the traditional calendar we call that a real, real year. 1,460 days plus that one extra day. But in this calendar, and this is why I opened up the parenthesis, if you're still with me, you're gonna see why it, it, it mattered. In this calendar, that real year of 1,461 days is just a smaller increment of a larger, larger increment of time, a larger cycle that the calendar is based on. And that, that is what we call the God's year or the great year. And that is 1,460 of our 365 day years and then an extra, wait, 365 yeah, day years, and then an extra year for readjustment. So 1,461 years, 1,461 years. And the reason it is like that, you see, there's no, there's no convenient reason for counting that we would choose 1,461 that didn't offer us any convenience. That's based on the actual astronomical phenomenon. But who in a world of power hungry people that don't have time to investigate would take the time to find a cycle that goes 1,461 years, much longer than anybody lives, much longer than anybody's ambitions last, much longer than anybody gets to Google, get googly eyed over their gold. 1,461 years is the, cycle, the time it takes for the earth and the sun to return to their same position in accordance with the Sirius star. So the cycle of the Sirius star is 1,461 years. That is what this calendar is based on. Now, keep that in mind. I said that the increment of time that the calendar from the Nile Valley is based on is 1,461 years. If we consider now the way that the world has been going for the last 2,020 years, 2,020 years when those political leaders, those leaders with all that ambition said, you know what, we have enough authority now to reinvent the calendar. And instead of going on the same time, we're going to say it's year zero now, because now it's our time. For the last 2,020 years, they've been in power. But if we look at 2,020 years and put it beside 1,461 years, that means they've only been in power for a little over a year, if we're talking about the great year, or if we're talking about the God years. That means that their civilization, their systems, are their culture of authority is only at best, even if we give them some extra because they had to build it before they got the full authority, two years old, two great years old. If we now contrast that with the Nile Valley civilization who brought us this calendar 
that's basic increment of time is 1,461 years, and we have holy texts that date back over 200,000 years. You can find holy texts. If you're a scientist, even if you're a scientist, you're an anthropologist, want to be honest enough to admit it to you, you will find, we can find holy texts that old coming from the Nile Valley. That means that that civilization, that system, by God years even, is over 100 years old. Over 100 years old. So now what we're really talking about is 100 years of investigating, of learning the world of the gods, the perfect model of the world, learning nature, versus the two-year-old that just wants authority. The hundred-year-old elder, the two-year-old throwing a tantrum. Which one will you choose as a leader? If you live in a house, and the house has an elder that's over 100 years old with all that experience, and the house has a two-year-old, who's gonna who are you gonna let run the house? This is the situation that we're in today. When we talk about Western civilization, when we talk about the education system, when we talk about the languages, the modern languages, all of the things that we call in modern that we think are so, they have an authority, we have to question why are we giving it that authority? It's two years old versus 100 years old. So this is our situation. We had a civilization that was there helping humanity fit into the harmony of nature, a calendar helping fitting us into the harmony of nature. And now when we investigate the modern world, all we have is destruction, domination, authority, theft, because one needs wealth while the other has wealth. And we can see the global issues that we face in 2020 today. The epidemics, the pandemics, war, politics, and power, all of these things that we can see. But how did we get here? How could humanity, I mean, human beings are intelligent beings. How could we knowingly be in a house with a 100-year-old elder and a two-year-old and say, hey, two-year-old, what's, what's the day going to be today? How does that happen? That now brings us to colonization. And what is colonization? What is colonialism? Colonization is, by definition, again, the common definition that we all can agree on because it's in the dictionary that we gave authority to. Colonization is a central power that dominates uh, uh, neighboring powers or, or other powers, dominates other territories. A central power that dominates other territories. That sounds a lot like what we talked about already, right? A central power that dominates other territories. Colonization is as just to point it out in the introduction, it affects every aspect of our life because it's one power, one authority, taking the power and authority of a place that they don't even belong to. When we look in history, we can see that by the end of the 19th century, England, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, they had split up the continent of Africa in the Berlin Conference. They also had acquired territories throughout the world and colonized them, meaning that the authority that they installed in those places now was really 
coming from them. The people there now saw them as the authority all the way in France and their Frenchmen that was there running the country. And this had taken place, this was already done by the end of the 19th century. But what's important to understand is that this had already taken place in Europe. The kings of Europe had already done this in all of the territories around Europe thoroughly. They had already taken all of the land from people who were trying to live by, like their ancestors, like their fathers, farming their father's land. They were trying to carry out their traditions. They already had their land forcefully taken from them and then forced to work that land for other people. The system of colonization, the system of enslavement was perfected in Europe before it even came out. That means the majority of Europeans were already victimized by it before it even touched the rest of the world. This is colonization. I'll come back to that, but hopefully already we can see how much it looks like terrorism, because terrorism is an unlawful act of violence or intimidation to achieve a political aim. Colonization is forcefully dominating others' people who have their way of life. You can't just move a person away from their own way of life, how they do things, how their parents did things without some domination, without some intimidation, without murder, man. Today, I'm speaking to you as Jezreel to explain from Burkina Faso. I bring up Burkina Faso because not only is it the home of our master, it is also the cultural headquarters of the organization, the Earth Center. It is also where the Earth Center was built before it became the Earth Center. The first organization that Masanaba started was in Burkina Faso and it was called the Kepra Foundation. And Kepra was a group of traditional researchers, activists who came together to preserve their ancestral culture and to put their minds together to build on it, continue researching, but to use what was coming from that and look at what affects people of color, what affects Africans, and how can we make sure that we're bringing what comes from our culture to guarantee our future to take responsibility for our future and where we're going, not the Frenchmen that came and said they were the authority here. We don't, we don't want their solutions. We want our own solutions to what's affecting us. And by doing this, the work that was done became the really the foundational work that then Masanaba went on to uh, travel around the temples and build the uh, institution of the Earth Center. And he presented the Earth Center so that you could reclaim your culture and return to that ancestral knowledge in order to do the same, take responsibility for your future instead of giving it to the two-year-old in their power-hungry ambitions. I bring up Burkina Faso now, though, because the Earth Center is here. The first center that was started by the by, by Master Naba was in Ouagadougou, the first school, the one I was saying he was promoting by going to the radio shows. That school is still functioning in Ouagadougou. We also have temples in Fara and Gorma in the eastern region. We also have activities in Bobo Julasso where we are today. And we have activities in other temples that we work with throughout the country in some of the smaller cities or villages. These are the larger cities in the country. In Burkina Faso today, 
more and more of the country is being red zoned. Being red zoned meaning that it's a danger for the acts of terrorism that are taking place. And for those of you who saw the FB Facebook Live that uh, we did promoting this lecture series, I had mentioned that. And I had said it was red zoned. A lot of the eastern region is red zoned. The northern region is red zoned now. And it is being categorized as unsafe for especially foreigners to go to, travelers to go to, tourists to go to. And I want to make one thing clear. I'm not denying that there is terrorism happening there. There's acts of terror happening there. I'm not denying that there's not killings happening there. For me to deny it would be disrespectful to the families that have lost family members in those acts. In that Facebook Live, I had contrasted it with Chicago and other cities around the United States that I was living in before I moved here, Chicago, Baltimore, where we hear of murder and unsafe things on a scale much, much larger than what's happening in Burkina Faso. But that's not to deny what's happening in Burkina Faso. What's happening in Burkina Faso is very interesting, and it brings up uh, something I want to let you know about that didn't really make its way to the global news. There's an individual in the eastern region that actually is one of our elders in the Earth Center. He was one of the colleagues of Master Malba uh, during the Kepler Association times, and he also grew up in the same region that Masanabe is from, in Fara and Gorma, the Gulmu Empire. Uh, this man, after the recent um, uh, ousting or coup d'etat of Blaise Compaore, the last president of, or the president before the current one of Burkina Faso, um, some of these acts that can be considered terrorism or unsafe started to really occur. While, while in, during Campari's presidency, you didn't really have them. But once there's no president, of course, people who uh, are, can, are bandits or you know, want, to do, want to steal from people on the road, stop people on the road, steal from everybody in the bush taxis, et cetera, et cetera. All of that, they have more freedom to do that because the person in charge is not there to hold the structure together. And so this man saw that, and what he did was he organized the hunters, the traditional hunters in his area the traditional hunters that have been initiated into hunting. But when I say hunting, it's not the same maybe hunting you know. It's not like people that go and then, you know, pose with giraffe carcasses or pose with rhinoceroses with their rifle. A hunter is somebody that masters nature so that they can go into the bush and the, the obscurity of the bush for whatever, uh, for the well-being of the community. Whether they're going in it for food, whether they're going in it for medicine, herbal medicines, whether they're going in it to protect their community, whatever the well-being is needed for their community, that's really what they're going in. And they've learned all of the tricks of nature, the secrets of nature, so that they can do that safely and they can keep their community safe. So he organized the hunters and he organized them into a network so that if any peculiar activity was happening throughout the country, any people were uh, seen in villages they're not usually seen in and seen with, with uh, military assault rifles because those have popped up in West Africa now 
the network would get that communication to him within minutes. And so when he did this, very quickly, everything stopped. Because now these people who mastered nature, who had secrets, the same secrets that people came to the Nile Valley looking to learn, now these people were protecting the villages. So even as somebody planned to go and uh, steal or rob a village or a bush taxi, even when they arrived, the hunters would be there waiting for them. Even when they arrived, if they tried to use their guns, the guns wouldn't work on the hunters. And so quickly, word started spreading that, okay, now there's these groups that are protecting, and it's much harder to take advantage of villagers that weren't armed before, to take advantage of travelers that weren't armed before. And of course, villagers all over the country were so thankful to this individual. At a certain point, at a certain point, even of course, it brought on attention from the governments and even neighboring countries even called this individual and said, wow, can you set up the same thing in our place? But within Burkina, he was also brought in, questioned, put in jail, you know, because the authority today is really about politics. And when you look like you are threatening the power of the one in power, it's the problem. Even if you're just protecting the people. And for him, he said, because as I said, he's an he's a elder that the Earth Center works with, and we had a chance to sit down with him. And he was explaining to us that for, for him, he knew that the national military, the, the police, they don't have the reach to go into every village, to every village community. So what I was doing was just really helping them, really helping the nation protect its people. And I have to do that as a member of the nation, as, as a member of Burkina, I can't just sit on, sit on my hands and expect somebody else to do it for me. So I set up this network that I know could reach where they couldn't reach. But another thing that he explained to us is that when he was, his hunters were going and uh, immobilizing these attacks, these events, what they were finding was that a lot of the people were people who had been moved off of their land, moved off of their farmlands, moved out of their houses by corporations that took their land because they found out there's gold under, under, underneath. And so they threw them out, gave them no livelihood, gave them nothing. And this was happening again and again. Some, in some cases, it was uh, religious, uh, what do you call that? Uh, people that were crazed with religion needed to convert other people, religious fanatics. Um, but in many cases, it was people who colonial structures, colonial corporations had taken away their livelihood, and now how are they left to feed their family? In addition to that, as I was saying earlier, there was a large amount of guns brought to West Africa, very modern, new, military-grade guns that were dropped in West Africa, just as you see in places like Chicago, just as you see in places like Baltimore, just like you see in places around the world where you wonder in those inner city places, in, those, in these villages, there's no manufacturing plants to make military style guns, where are they coming from? That's another lecture. There was a, a time when Western powers to weaken structures here in West Africa were planning on a big war here that Gaddafi said no to and the guns just sat. Well, now those guns are being put to use 
by people who are being put out, by corporations, by uh, more powerful people than them from their livelihood, from their living place. This is the situation that's happening in Burkina Faso. I bring that up though because if it's not clear, I want to make it very clear that colonization is terrorism. Colonization is terrorism because it is the act. I mean, to colonize, you have to weaken. To colonize a territory, you have to weaken that territory. Because if that territory was not weak, why would they need you as their leader? Why would they need someone new with a new culture or a foreign culture, foreign values, foreign way of doing things, foreign language to come and be the authority for them? The process of colonization demands that you weaken the one being colonized. Today, we just saw what happened in Chicago. What happened in Chicago happened in places all around the United States. People rising up, expressing their anger for being mowed down, for being killed, for being murdered by the police the system that somehow they thought was supposed to be protecting them. And we all can sympathize, can relate to that anger that we saw. That anger is not just specific to US. We just saw it in Greece with uprisings there a little while ago. We see it in Cameroon with what's going on there. We saw a coup just happen in Mali, the neighboring country here. We see that anger happening around the world in many places. When people see that they're under conditions that just aren't fair to them. They're under conditions that are weakening them for the benefit of somebody else. But I bring up this experience with this elder in Burkina Faso because it was very powerful for me to see as somebody who grew up in the United States. Somebody who grew up in the United States where we feel like we're so justified in saying, you know, these police, why, why are they killing us when they never showed you they wanted to do anything else but kill you, contain you, weaken you. And then I saw this elder say, you know what, my problem is my responsibility to fix. My problem is my responsibility to fix, but of course this elder had a traditions, traditions to fix it from, a whole structure to fix it from, a whole structure to plug into, to build a network, to make sure that now our people can take care of themselves. We don't have to depend on the government. It was very powerful for me. Today, the realities is that colonization reaches very far in all aspects of our life because it reaches into our brain. It reaches into the way we think. It reaches into the values we have. A few months ago, my sister Jedka Zeshara did a presentation on environmental issues and climate change. And she was touching on this point of the values that colonization has given to people that has really changed the way we approach life. And a lot of times we don't realize that the colonization process we've been put under, we went through, has changed the way we think and we approach life. For example, every Christian, every person who 
was educated in a Christian uh, nation can't deny the fact that the one they look to as a savior was victim to the Roman uh, what's it called to the Roman court he was um, he was put on the cross by the, by the Roman court so the one that the Christian is educated to be like a victim is a victim and so this emulation of a victim spread with Christianity and if you check yourself if you have a family if you have those grandparents I was talking about at the beginning that were telling you you know you have to be saved you have to go to church you have to go you have to check yourself now for how is it that I value being a victim how is it that I even would rather take that path than for taking responsibility. Because I can't deny that's what I saw Jesus do. That's why all Christians love him. Because he was a victim for you, why we were told. Or as at least that's what we're told. So we will have to check what are the spiritual effects of colonialism? What are the values they left us with that are now dictating how we approach, how we look at spirituality, how we approach, how we look at life, how we approach, how we look at ourselves. After Christianity brought the notion of the victim, then Islam came and brought the notion of, they really pushed on the notion of the world is in them. And if you can die for Allah before the world ends, then that's your benefit. You're going to be rewarded. And now you see a lot of the religious fanatics that are ready to kill are coming from Islam because that's the values it came with. That's the values it colonized with. That's the values it educates with the story that it brought. These things affect us very deeply. We don't even see. We don't even notice because we think they're us. But when we can look and see that, wait a second, everybody under the flag, secretly or not, wants to be a victim. Everybody under the flag of Jesus wants to be a victim. Everybody under the flag of Muhammad thinks that the world is ended and they have to please Allah before it does. These are important things that we all have to look at, and if we are going to take responsibility for our lives and the lives of our descendants, we all will have to investigate how colonization has affected ourselves and our families and do the work to take it out. Do the work to re-educate ourselves so that our life is actually serving our life instead of serving a political ambition. We're using our energies to serve our life and the life of our descendants instead of someone who just threw their two-year-old tantrum because they wanted to be known as the leader instead of the one who actually fits in that position. So you have to ask yourself, how do you identify? In this crisis of civilization that we're in, where somehow the world is being ran by those who just seek material wealth and politics or power. The world is being ran by people who are still infatuated with the things our ancestors left a long time ago because they have to face, hey, you die anyway. What do I look like taking everybody's wealth here if by the end of it, I'm just going to die, and then you can come back to get it. It doesn't make any sense. So how is it that we identify? And not just how is it that we identify, because, you know, the world is becoming more and more of a place where you can say you are whatever you want to say. But 
how does the world identify you based on how you behave? It was very difficult for me growing up in America and realizing that as an American, I'm going to be identified with all of the heinous, vicious things America is doing all over the world. But to change that, I will have to look inside myself and see well, what values did I take from them. Maybe if I had their guns and I had their money, I might be doing the same thing if I don't make sure to take those values out and recondition myself. Because colonization happens in a few ways. You can't, like I said, you can't just take people away from how they've been functioning. You can't just tell people the way you've been doing it, the way your parents taught you, the way their parents taught you, don't do it anymore, do it our way. It has to come by killing, it has to come by intimidation, but once that phase is over, then it just comes by education. Then it comes by conditioning. Then it comes by manipulation. So how will we identify? How will we behave so that nature identifies us the way we would wish instead of the way we were ushered into? This situation is so, so serious and I, I know I'm getting close to my time, but I want to kind of wrap this up with a short story on how, how what the world is really like. And this story, this story, um, you can also read in the Philosophy Podium uh, by Master Nava, his uh, philosophy book available at the Earth Center. This is the story of two friends, and it, it does well in ex explaining where we are today, but it also does well in, in explaining the values that we have that even all of us help get us there. This, or lack of value. This is a story of two friends, two of the best of friends, very good friends. They, they always see with each other. One is a coveter, meaning they're ambitious, and one is a very envious, meaning they see what others have, they have one. And these two friends, one day, got the chance of a lifetime. A God revealed himself, revealed itself to these two friends. So this must have happened in the land of mystery in Africa where things like, like the uh, other dimensions revealing themselves to humanity are more common. But a God revealed itself to these friends, and he said, you know, I want to give you a gift today. You're lucky, I want to give you a gift today. And the friends were so pleased, so happy to hear it. And the God continued and said, but my gift is going to come with some conditions. I will give one of you whatever you want whatever you wish for, but when I give it to you, I'm gonna give it double to your friend. They get twice as much as you give. And with that, the two friends were challenged. I mean, if that happened to you, what would, what would you say? They didn't know, just like probably you don't know. And they sat there in silence for a long, long time. Because as you can imagine, whenever one of them thought of something they wanted to say, they thought about, well, I won't get it twice. He will get it twice. If he says it first, then I will get it twice. So none of them wanted to speak first. They all were waiting for the other one to speak first and then they can just enjoy. 
they were quiet, they were quiet even for hours, where the God was like, uh, <laughs> I brought this opportunity. He didn't say that. But, so finally, after a long, long time, one of the friends said, I want you to poke out one of my eyes and make me a one-eyed person. And I want you to make me suffer horribly. And the God was so sad and disappointed by what he heard. But there's a God. The God's not like a human being. He's not going to go back. He, he does what he says. He's perfect. And so the God watched, sad, by the ugliness of human beings as the one-eyed friend suffering in great pain was somehow pleased by the fact that his friend next to him was suffering worse. And he took the hand of his friend who was fully blind and then he helped him get home. This is the situation that we're in today. People who knew they didn't have what it takes to run the world, wanted the authority to run it, and would even place humanity in a much worse situation if they could at least be seen as better off than others. When I ask you, who do you identify with? How do you identify? The reality is the only people that will stick up for a process like colonization, that will defend it, that will say, but look at the values it brought us, are people that see that they gained from it. But if they really think about it, if they think about the torment they feel inside, they think about how they watch their children and maybe their children go to drugs and maybe their children go to this and they see the torture that it really has in them. The only relief is that, hey, they're better off than somebody else. Though. That's how ugly we are. And before we put our noses up, make sure you're not that ugly. We just have to make sure we don't behave like that. Anybody that will defend it, if you defend it, you at least have to do the work in trying to improve whatever situation you're in. You can't just defend it from the people who know that they're suffering. So this is our situation. And as Master Naba once said, a human being is an intelligent being. You can destroy that human being with domination, with aggression, or you can only govern that human being with intelligence. The reality of our world today is that even these governments I talk about, even these political leaders I talk about, they know that they don't have the knowledge to lead humanity to a better place. And they know some people do. To be honest, in the comedic temples at the Earth Center, in some of the ceremonies that were coming out of our temples, before COVID-19 hit, the type of spiritual work they were asking us to do to protect our communities, we were really like, what is this? because we had some people coming on, on pilgrimage. So we were like, we usually don't have to do works this size to protect people. And then soon after, we realized, okay, we're protecting everybody all over the world from what's about to hit, everybody in our communities. Those things are known. This is why epidemics didn't hit Africa, because the kings of Africa the kingdoms of Africa, the nobility, they know the procedures to do 
to affect the energy, to talk with nature, to talk to the world, the gods, to cover your place. Political leaders don't know that. They know guns and bombs, surveillance. So many of them know that the only way they have, the only op option they have now is to go back and to ask those people who actually have the knowledge that fits the position they're in how to go forward. So for you, for all of us as individuals, we better catch up because the responsibility is not on those leaders. And I'm saying that, but if you're expecting them to have the spiritual honesty to do that, that's a whole other thing. Many of them would rather see everybody die if they get to live a little bit longer. So if you realize this, then you will have to do the work in recovering yourself with the wisdom that some people have kept from our ancestral paradigm. You will have to do the work in becoming a higher quality individual as defined by those ancestral civilizations. For all of those who are interested, we have a community that's growing around the world. We have a movement that's coming back to Kemet and Kemetic values. We have more and more people that wish to be initiated into the Utah schools, into the Kemetic temples, but we know that we're not in every place. We're not available for everybody. Some people travel to do it, but everybody doesn't have that opportunity or those resources. We also have a membership that is a growing community of people coming together around this knowledge to improve their lives, to put their heads together, and even to support those who are doing it, those who are on the ground. After every lecture we give like this every month, though, that group comes together to talk about it and see how can they put it into practical solutions for their community? How can they better understand it for their household, for themselves? This is what Kemet always was. Kemet was not a place. Kemet was not just a locality. Kemet was a culture of people that said, you know what, we're interested in learning how to fit into the harmony of nature. We're interested in learning how to fit into the harmony and the order that the divine have created. We want to master ourselves. We want to be quality people that other people don't have to be afraid of. We want to be quality people that other people can depend on, that other people seek out so that they can assist them with their lives, with solving their problems. This is what Kemet was. This is why people from all over the world traveled to the Nile Valley. This is what the Mas this is what Masanaba has made available again. We have the EC membership that you can become a member and enter that community. We also have study groups forming around the world where groups of people that aren't in the place of a school or that just can't commit fully to the initiation can still come together with like-minded people to study what's coming from Firefly Productions, study what the Earth Center is bringing from the Kemetic Temples that's reconnected them, reconnecting them to something very deep inside of them something that makes them human, that connects them to their ancestors. You can join us in this movement. Thank you all for coming on tonight, for listening. Uh, I wish all of you the courage to stand and fight for your destiny, yourself, because there's nobody else besides you that's going to see it as important as, important as it is. Even me, who maybe might care for you, I have mine to deal with, so I can't deal with yours as much as I would deal with mine. So I, get, I wish that courage for you. I wish that your ancestors will support you and guide you to where you can uh, have their knowledge, their principles revealed to you so that you can put them back in your life. And I know for myself and the Earth Center, You've been guided to one place today. Uh, hopefully you take the time to investigate. I want to open 
the floor now for some questions. If any questions have come in on the chat, if not, then I'm going to say goodbye, but I'm going to give the tech some time to see if any come in now. I also want to let you know that uh, the Earth Center is also constantly doing projects, supporting the traditional communities here. We have had some of our traditional communities even moved out of their villages, out of their lands. So we do need donations to help uh, take care of those people who have been taken off of their farmlands, off of their livelihood. Uh, we also have um, continued construction in our healing center, continued construction in our house of culture, um, one of our centers here in West Africa. Um, so your donation is very helpful. You can go online on our website to make any donations. Any questions? Uh, yes, we have uh, one question from Bizon, Bizonang, and uh, they're saying, asking this question, how is the Earth Center community connecting with other African traditional communities like Ifa, et cetera? Okay, um, the question was, how does the Earth Center connect with other African traditional communities like Ifa, et cetera? Do I offer the question? Um, the connection um, with other African communities, if I can call them that, or spiritual communities, uh, it happens, but you should understand that it happens in the temples first, meaning that we, as, as I stated in the beginning, uh, Master Nava traveled around many temples all around the continent of Africa in building the earth center. And so he went to those temples, letting them know what he was doing, letting the divinities of those temples know what he was doing, gaining their support even to build the earth center. So, a lot of that is already behind the earth center. But now, just on a human, practical, face-to-face -face level, uh, we have an annual pilgrimage where we travel to different temples. And we, we don't really see the temples as being us and them and different, like Untam versus Voodoo versus Ifa versus uh, Akan, because really all of them uh, are under the the umbrella of Kemetic civilization. You have the Ndam school in Kemetic civilization. You have the Voodoo school in Kemetic civilization. So all of them are a part of the same thing. And when deities or the divinities in the temples are already united, when we go into that temple and the people will check in divination with their divinities, then there's already a, there's already an alliance. None of the humans can really get in the way of that alliance. So hopefully that answers the question. There's a lot more. They're kind of already together in their source, and then they're already together in uh, what they're taking care of in their temples. It's just the humans catching up uh, with the two legs that we have, and the time and space that we conquer at that time. Any other questions? Uh, we have another question, question from Derek Andrews. Mm -hmm. What is the first steps to changing your colonial values? What are the first steps to changing your colonial values? Good question. Um, the first steps are really realizing that you have colonial values, realizing that what you've been so passionate about your whole life, even fighting for, even believing in, you got them from somewhere. Every one of them, you got them from somewhere. And even if you got them from somewhere you love, like your parents, those, those parents got them from somewhere. And so even just the questioning with some honesty of those values is a first step. And that has to be done because you will have to be ready to clear things off your plate before you can put new things on there. But the reality is that we can't really overcome colonization by being in colonization. 
that's the very difficult reality because what the colonizer does, what the politician does, remember, that's where all of their passion, all of their ingeniosity is put to conquer and to contain. So they, so our modern societies really cut us off from a lot of perspectives, knowledge, information that comes as total different, totally different than what they're, what they've brought us. And so that's why, I mean, the, this age of information has kind of opened that up, but even it's still very difficult to get information that's really different than the paradigm you, you, you exist. In. Um, but that's why what Master Nava did was so important because he's someone that came from a totally different place. He grew up and he tells all of the initiates on the first day of class, if you see, if you get the chance to come and see where I grew up, when I wake up, there's no street lights there. There's no TVs there. There's nothing there but the bush and you. And all of the things in the bush you can't see. So this person came from a paradigm that was completely different. And that's why they were able to, from outside, look in and say, wow, none of that makes sense. That's not how our ancestors did it. And a lot of times it's, or it's really that uh, um, understanding that exists outside of the box that we've been put in that will help us to get out of the box. Um, so at a certain point, that, that process, though it starts with questioning, self-questioning, it starts with investigating and learning what you can get your hands on, it's going to have to bring you to a master that has the experience and the paradigm that's outside of the box to lead you out of there. Thank you for the question. Any others? Um, uh, Me Three Sons had a question, which is, is the racism that we have seen today and historically part of colonial terrorism? What can we begin doing to combat this as individuals? Good question. Is the racism that we see historically a part of colonial terrorism? What can we do to combat this as individuals? Good question. Um, the reality of racism is that it is definitely a weapon used by the colonizer. It is definitely a result of the mind that has led to colonization. Because what, what really we see is that the European authority suffered from a human shortcoming that I'm sure many of us suffer from. And that is, they wanted to blame outside for their condition. If you study the history of Europe, Europe was a very, very difficult place to live. It didn't have, it didn't offer fertile land. It didn't offer crops until the European brought crops from other places. Uh, it was very difficult to live in. And if we're talking about just material wealth, natural wealth, it was very desolate, it was very poor. Now, when the Europeans saw other people in the world who didn't live like that, now the blame will be placed on those other people. And this is just something we all do as human beings. If we don't have the education, if we don't have the quality, we will blame the, our neighbor for why we live the way we live, for why we are in the situation that we're in. And this is really what started colonization, racism, even to the point that people in the, the, the political authorities in Europe have this so bad that they will even cross the ocean to go tell people that didn't even know they were there, you're my problem and I need to change you. You see how ridiculous that is? 
you have to cross the whole Atlantic to go tell people you don't praise Jesus, you're evil, you're the problem? Oh, well, you didn't even know me. How can I be your problem? So this, when we're talking about racism, what we're really talking about before I get to actual racism, the seeds of it is in all of us. The seeds of it in creating a barbarism where I see me versus you and you being my problem. That's what, that's the seeds of it. Now racism is really beyond that and that seed that you can unearth in yourself, each and every one of you. Beyond that, racism is really big distraction. It's just a big distraction like many distractions that the colonial system presents us with to keep us on a wheel, chasing things that are made up so that we don't focus on our reality, so that we don't focus on finding some ground and some footing that actually helps us orient ourselves in time and space. Because race itself is made up. Who is white, who is black? You see? So all of that was brought to you by the colonizer. And it was brought to you as one of those forms of manipulation that I said that's brought to weaken someone. But all of it starts with the seed of, hey, I'm having a difficult time. It's because of you. And like I'm saying, we see that today. Don't think that that has to do with anybody's skin tone. Don't think that that has to do with anybody's, you know, how much melanin content they have in their body and all of these far-fetched things like that. Everybody does that. I, I teach in the initiatic schools. I'm an initiate of the initiatic schools. Even people in the initiation, they come to the initiation, they love us one day because the initiation is hard and it has them suffering and facing themselves. They hate us, we're the problem the next day because we're the teachers that hold it. And this is not just white people that do this. This is not just black people that do this. This is any human being that feels that pressure, that has that seed, that value in them. They will make your neighbor, your, their, their neighbor, their problem. But understand as Master Nava used to say, your neighbor is never your problem. Next question. We have a question from Ibrahim Kanemsa Medusheta Ture. If I am a person who is not familiar with the Earth Center, what is a basic concept I could practice to protect myself from the evils of colonialism? Okay. Uh, it's very, uh, the question was, because uh, I know this, the person working the computer is behind the mic, just in case you couldn't hear me clearly. If I'm not a person familiar with the Earth Center, what are some things that I can do to protect myself from colonialism? Is that correct? Correct. It's a, forgive me, but it's kind of an odd question to ask on a lecture where you are familiar with the Earth Center because you've been familiarized with the Earth Center. But if I'm to go off into uh, theoretic, um, into theories, theoretic hypotheses and things. Um, colonization is uh, is ever pervasive. As we say, and it affects all aspects of our lives, but what you can do is explore your roots. Find out at least where your people um, stop behaving as they behaved and started behaving and speaking how others behaved and spoke and see if there's any connection to that. Um, but even now, it's hard for me because I'm not talking to those who I'm speaking to because those people know the Earth Center. And the value of the Earth Center is that the Earth Center has not only brought some things that people have been able to preserve, but it's brought the actual structures that allow them to preserve it. When we talk about colonization, uh, Sheikh Antijap made a very important point that uh, I wanted to mention before this lecture ended, is that colonization is so detrimental 
not because there's killing, there's intimidation, there's terrorism. There's been countless times in history when one army defeated another and destroyed, you know, lives, destroyed institutions and infrastructure. All of that, all it takes is time and those people can recover. But colonization is so terrible because it seeks to destroy the structure, the structure that a people have to pass their identity to their next generation, to pass their edu to educate their next generation on who they are. And when you destroy that, now they can't, it's so much harder. They can't recover on their own because you, you, you cut them from the values and the education to recover, you see? So this is really what colonization is. So there's a big difference between, let's say, uh, my family was able to hold on to some things. Uh, for example, in the West, we have a lot of uh, indigenous groups, um, Native Americans, indigenous Americans, that have retained many things like dances, uh, the cultural dress that they wear in dances and ceremonies, even language. You have cultures all around the world that preserve some things like this. But these are just kind of like the, the outfits of the culture. If they didn't preserve the initiation, if they didn't preserve the kingships, if they didn't preserve the structures that those things are based on, well, then it's just kind of like they have a facade that they still preserve, but the heart of what's there to really make it mean something for the people was lost. And you see that in tribes all around the world. Native America is prevalent, but you see that even in Africa. You see that all over the world in indigenous places because every time a colonizer comes, he's coming to take away the power that indigenous people give to their authority, to their structure, and replace it with a colonial structure. This is really the, the big thing. So that's something that one could try, but even then they will have to find a place that have preserved that structure because that structure is what's important. It's not just sounding like your ancestors or looking like them or dressing like them, but it's making sure that you have a structure, the rules, the principles they live on, and all of those things. Thank you for the question. We have a next question from Camila Hadia, and uh, it's a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, what is the spiritual origin or explanation of colonization or terrorism of traditional people who have been loyal to their spiritual values? Why was colonization successful on Africans with access to spiritual technologies? Why weren't spiritual technologies used? Okay. Um, what was the spiritual explanation? for why colonization worked on Africans who had spiritual technology is the question, right? basically. Basically. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, the reality is that before I kind of expand the answer to the question, the reality that maybe you're not told in the West or in modern uh, cities is that not every place in Africa was colonized. Many people use the spiritual technologies to protect themselves. Even you have some places, some villages where even if, even in the times of enslavement, even if they were captured in the day, by the night they're back in their bed. So the, maybe the understanding that is in the question is a little partial because it, it did happen. And, and even throughout the world, even where the spiritual technologies were not as tightly preserved, um, you still had many people resisting on very, you know, consistent that you don't hear about in the history books that you don't hear about from the colonizer when he gives you the account. So uh, 
let's already kind of fix that question or that perspective. But um, the other thing is that not even if we're talking just about Africa, Africa is a huge place. Africa is a huge place of many tribes, of many ethnic groups, many villages. Not every tribe preserved their, their connection to the origins well. Not every tribe, even at the time of enslavement, at the time of colonialism, were connected to that. Many had already, you know, kind of lost that, and then that made them vulnerable to new things. Um, and then the human being is just vulnerable. I said the human being is an intelligent being, but the human being can be educated and can be primed to be a very unintelligent being. And we see that all around the world today because we live under systems that their ambition, their main objective is to weaken us, to weaken our intelligence. So the human being, um, if, if in a tribe's culture, an ethnic group's culture, they didn't build into their culture a way to protect their structure, they, they lost. Uh, and they, they lost just enough to, to make them vulnerable. So this is what I would say. But don't, but don't think that every tribe has lost it. That's why the Earth Center is here today. Uh, we have a, another question from Moisha Yehuda. Uh, is there a pilgrimage to Merita this year? Is there a pilgrimage to Merita this year? Good question. Um, I, I am not involved in the activities of uh, the projects in Merita branch at that level. Um, so it would be best to send that request to our headquarters in Chicago um, or to email us and to check on that. Next question is from uh, Oshalim. I will be there if there is one, but <laughs> check on to see if there is one. Yes, question from Oshalim. Uh, uh, about the story of the terrorist in about 630 BC. Mm -hmm. Uh, were our pharaoh and, and we not in a position to defend ourselves? Did they not see the evil that he did coming so that they could have prevented it? Good question. Uh, the question is, in the story, the account of the terrorist can we see in 630 BC? Where was the pharaoh and did they not see him coming? Couldn't they have done something to protect themselves? Um, what I didn't explain and what is often not explained in our textbooks, uh, in colonial accounts of history, is that any invader you hear about coming into the Nile Valley, they only come in the period of time when the, no pharaoh is sitting. So there's always, between each pharaoh, there's always a period of at least four years when there's no pharaoh on the throne. So it's only in this time that an invader has the opportunity to come in and try crazy antics like Ken BC did and claim that they have the, the throne or claim that they want to be the pharaoh. So all of the people that you heard about, even the great people you heard about, Ken BC, Xerxes, all these people who were trying for Egypt, they only got to Egypt, they only, excuse me, got to the Nile Valley when the pharaoh wasn't on the throne. If the pharaoh was on the throne, even before they get into their journey, they already get stopped. Even after, I don't think I mentioned this either, even after Cambyse killed the holy cow, asked people to eat the meat, three months later he was dead. Nobody had to kill him, three months later nature took him. And then his army ran away. So yes, there are those powers that were protecting the place, but there is this notion of kind of cycles that the place itself, the structure itself runs on. And so there's always that four year period when invaders come into the Nile Valley. You will even see that in some tribes today that migrated from the Nile Valley to West Africa. Some tribes have ceremonies after a king 
after one king finishes and dies, they will beg neighboring tribes to come and invade their place because they're used to that, that custom from the Nile Valley. If nobody comes to invade after my king, then I felt like that king didn't do enough to raise our value, to raise our quality to where people want, want to come and covet. So this was actually a part of the culture. Hopefully that um, answers the question. Next question is from uh, uh, Bizanin. How do our youth learn the importance of moving away from the colonial seeds of terrorism we all grew up with? How do our youth learn the importance of moving away from the seeds we all grew up with? Good question. Through their parents is the best answer for that. That is why the Earth Center's Utam School is really targeted to adults because adults are the ones to teach their children. Remember, in the, in a big effect, consequence of colonization is that we sit and we sit on our hands and we think other people will do what is our responsibility to do. Our life is our responsibility. Our descendants are our responsibility. So a lot of people always bring us that question, like, well, what do we have for children? Because uh, I want to send my children there or uh, I want to make sure my children get it. But if you don't get it first, your children are going to be hard-fetched to get it. They might get it, but if you don't, have it to re re-emphasize it, to reaffirm it in the house, they will lose it. So through their parents. Next question. Next and uh, looks like one of the last ones. We have a question from Chris R. What is the responsibility of the individual for their own gro growth and ascension versus opposing the system of colonialism for the community as well? Very good question. Chris, R. what is the responsibility for an individual for their own ascension and becoming a revolution versus opposing the colonial system? Can you say that again? Yeah, uh, versus opposing the system of colonialism uh, for the community as well. Versus opposing the system of colonialism for the community as a whole. Good question. And uh, perfect question to end on because if in this lecture I uh, didn't make myself clear and it sounded like I'm saying you need to oppose the colonial system or go against the colonial system, that was a misrepresentation on my part. The colonial system is weakened when people don't give it their attention and their authority. And the colonial system is weakened when you give uh, your attention to your ancestral structures and to yourself and what would be better for yourself. Uh, so definitely your focus should be on your own ascension, your own evolution. That was what I was pointing out with the strength that those people in the Nile Valley displayed even when Cambisi was trying. Nobody tried to fight him. He's only one person. Maybe they could, you know, they even have spiritual technologies. They could have did away with him even earlier than that. But nobody cared to leave their own spiritual responsibilities and path to go against him. My master once told me, if I ever see anybody as my enemy and I will take my energies away from progressing, and put them against their energies, I already lost. I already wasted my time. So it was a good question, brother. Our time really, I mean, our, our efforts, our energy should be focused on doing what's best for us, doing what's best for our spirit, the evolution of our spirit, rather than thinking that we have to oppose or attack anyone. Because as stated, your neighbor is never your problem. Your neighbor is never your problem. Even when your neighbor is, is aggressive towards you, then the problem is why are you still there with that neighbor? Why are you entering into the dualistic with that neighbor? Masanaba said that when he was growing up in his village, 
he saw what was taking place that Jezreelita was talking about. People coming in, one in their gold, one in their wealth, one in their food from the farms. And he asked with his elders, if they want these things, why don't we just give it to them? And the elders said, because if they just wanted our wealth, our gold, even the, our, our yields from our crops, we would give them that, but they don't. They want our world. And we've even ran away. They wanted the Nile Valley. We gave them to them. We gave them that. We even ran as far as the ocean. We couldn't go any for it further. We ran west even to the, to the western coast. We can't go anymore. But they still want our world. And if we give them our world, where will we live? What will we live in? So the point is that you protect that world. The point is that not that you go against them. If you go against them utilizing tactics and weapons and things that they use, you already forfeited your world because your world didn't have that anymore. Your world never said to do that. So definitely your energy should be spent on recovering yourself and recovering your ancestors in yourself and your ancestral values and structures within yourself. The structure piece is such an important part though because what we're really suffering from in the West is that structure. Like I was pointing out, the elder in Fada who created the network of hunters, he did it because he has structure. Even many of you may not know this, but people from Burkina Faso, when they are in the West, in cities in the West, they're the only ones that I've heard of that have a king. The community in Chicago will designate a king. The community in Chicago will work with the king that's designated in New York all because they know their structure is what provides them their survival. That means that when people come, that community, that structure led by that king now knows, okay, this person just came. He needs to do a fundraiser to start his business. We don't have those structures. And we depend in the West, people that are came up under colonization, we depend on the structures of the same system that's there to weaken us. Every day they wake up, they think of how can we better weaken them. We can depend on those structures. The structures will have to be based on what our ancestors were doing. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to have the humility to go back to where those structures exist. Thank you. Thank you all for giving me your time tonight or today, wherever you are on the planet. Uh, we hope to see you next month. For our members, we hope to see you soon in the forum um, that will follow this. For our initiates, we will see you in the temples. Uh, for all else, we look forward to you investigating the Earth Center. Uh, look to meet each and every one of you one day and so that our spirits can continue on this journey and recovering ourselves and recovering the comedic civilization and the values that kept us safe, surviving for so long. Well,